seated. Good morning and Merry Christmas. Yeah, some of you were reluctant about that. It's still the Christmas season. We call this the first Sunday after Christmas. And we're still celebrating Christmas. We're even going to light the Christ candle on the Advent wreath today. Um, I want to make sure, did everybody find a good place to sit? There's still a couple up front here. I always say that when we're on TV because they can't see the back and that makes people listening think that we have a packed crowd. But if you're at home listening, either right now in live or later this week and you've picked up this service, we welcome you as well and pray that this is a meaningful service for you and uh, glad to have all of you here today. My name is Lyle Shane. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I'm the uh, substitute today. The, as I used the phrase yesterday, the real pastor is gone on vacation, as you see in the bulletin announcement, and, uh, and I'm happy to fill in and, and provide the service for us today. It is Communion Sunday. No, it's not the first Sunday of the month, but uh, as we announced in the messenger, uh, we're also using John Wesley's covenant service, and uh, to confirm our renewed covenant, as we'll do a little bit later in this service, uh, communion is always a good thing to add to that. I've included a, a brief prayer of confession and a time of pardon as part of the lead-in to the great thanksgiving for our uh, communion service today. Otherwise, we just follow the bulletin as there, uh, except we're adding the lighting of the Christ candle in a moment. But uh, before we do that, let's... Uh... Oh, we're going to let you be seated and go to the lighting of the Christ candle now. And then you'll stand for the song, Waiting, Waiting, and, uh, and then greet one another. So just relax. Just relax. To light the Christ candle, we're going to read Isaiah 52, 7 through 10. It's on page 642 of your pew Bible. However, the version I'm reading is not what you read there. So... How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy, for eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. On this first Sunday after Christmas Day, we celebrate the Christ, that Christ Jesus comes to us every day. With the angels we sing, glory to God in the highest heaven, Together, we sing for joy. A baby has been born in Bethlehem. Like the shepherds, we kneel before the manger of hope. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings us good news, who announces salvation, who says to us, your God reigns. Sing out with praise. Hope has come to us. To poor and to rich, to old and young, to the infinite sky and the humble earth, to people of all nations and all hues of color. Break forth together in singing, Jesus is born. As we light the Christ, the Christ candle, let's sing with praise and joy, verse 5 only, of Waiting, Waiting. It's the insert in your bulletin. Let's stand and sing together. No more waiting, no more waiting for God to show the way. No more waiting, no more waiting to celebrate that day. Love was born as prophesied of yore. Christ has brought us hope forevermore. Joy and peace will reign from shore to shore. So light one candle for the baby in the hay, 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 hay. Light one candle for the baby in the hay. 
And now let us greet one another and those around you as we welcome one another and share a Merry Christmas today. And all the children in the room are invited forward, both of them. I think we have children. We have a children's moment prepared. Thank you, Mary. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, yes, we have children. We have children who've been busy making links. Right, April? Yes. Yes, April's been really busy helping us make these chains. How are you today? Do you want to come up and sit too? Oh, you're comfortable where you are. Well, oh gosh, I guess we've got a broken link. We'll fix it, not to worry. You know, today we're going to be hearing in the scripture about a time when someone was waiting for the Savior to come. Just like we wait sometimes for the things that we want, the things that we need in our lives. And sometimes the waiting seems really hard. Well, there was an old man that you're going to be hearing about. He was very old, but he'd been told that he would be able to see all his hopes realized before he died. He was going to see someone who was going to be the Redeemer. And waiting is hard, isn't it, April? Well, we have put together these links here because the red stands for love and the green stands for growth. When I think about our church, I think about these ways that we are linked together. There are so many people who have taught me a lot about love and I think about them as the red. And I think about the green connecting us one to another because we grow as people, we grow in our hearts through the green and it connects us to more loving people. The church is a place where I find lots of wonderful, loving people who've taught me about love. And this old man, really, really old, waiting, 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 until 40 days after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary brought that little baby into the temple. And he grabbed hold of that baby and he held him. And he said, good God, I can die right now. Look at me. I've finally gotten to see all my dreams. Okay? We have to wait sometimes. It's hard to wait sometimes. And in the meantime, each one of us can be like that red. The red that's the love that connects us one to another and helps us all to grow. Now, I finally watched that movie, Frozen. Anybody ever see that? Oh, 
Some other people have had to see. It's a good movie. I kind of like it. But one thing that I remember is that it said, the one thing that you should always do is the next best thing. That just means you don't always know what the end game is. You might not know how to solve all the world's problems. But the one thing you need to do is the next best thing. And the next best thing is doing something that is loving so that God's the God in you connects with the God in all the rest of us. Shall we say our prayer? Ready? Okay. Dear Lord, help us connect with one another through the Holy Spirit that you've placed within us and help us to realize that the Holy Spirit doesn't just rest within our hearts but in the hearts of all of God's creation. Always help us to remember to do the next best thing and spread your love to others. Amen. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of the day. Creative God, God, you make, make all things, things new, new in, in heaven, heaven and, on and on earth. We come to you facing a new year with new desires and old fears, new decisions and old controversies, new dreams and old weaknesses. Because you are a God of hope, we know that you create all the possibilities of the future. Because you are a God of love, we know that you accept all the mistakes of the past. Because you are the God of our faith, we enter your gates with thanksgiving and praise. We come to your presence with gladness and a joyful noise, and we serve and bless you. Amen. Our first scripture reading of the day comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. You may follow it along in your pew Bibles in the New Testament on page 178. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so you are no longer a slave, but a child, and if a child, then also an heir through God. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts and the service of our lives be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We'll get to the Luke reading in just a moment. First, I want to ask, how was your Christmas? Did it all go perfect? Did it meet your expectations? Did all your relatives get along fabulously? Were there no controversial discussions of politics or religion? Did all the food turn out perfectly? Nobody burned a pecan pie like my folks did a few years ago. Nobody burned the sweet potatoes. Was all the food scrumptious and tasty? How'd you get along with the snow and the ice on Christmas Day? Sure, we got a white Christmas. But we also had the chance to slide into an intersection and dent up a car, as I know someone did. <laughs> Sometimes Christmas can be quite a disappointment. And we find ourselves thinking, what a disappointment. 
It's not what it's cracked up to be. Oh, and I forgot to ask, did every light on every tree burn perfectly? Halfway through the season, the whole string of lights around one of my doorways quit. It was working fine so for several couple of weeks, and it's been out for the last week. So you can point to all kinds of things and find all kinds of reasons to say, it's just a disappointment. It's not what we expected. It's not what it's cracked up to be. There was some surprises that we didn't expect. When Mary and Joseph took the baby to be dedicated in the temple, they too found a surprise from an old guy named Simeon. Luke tells us about it. Luke 2, beginning at the 22nd verse. Again, in your pew Bible, that's on page 53. Excuse me. Yeah, 53 and 54 in your pew Bible. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law, quote, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, end quote. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child, Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, and before I give you Simeon's quote, just, just stand there with Mary and Joseph for a moment in your mind's eye. They bring their precious baby, promised by God. Mary got that word early on. They bring him to the temple, and this, they're from Nazareth. They don't get to Jerusalem very often. They don't know what goes on in the temple very often. And this old guy, Simeon, late in age, it implies nearing death, grabs the baby from Mary or Joseph, whoever was carrying him. And Simeon says, Master, you are now dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, this child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. A sword will pierce your own soul too. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Mary, a sword will pierce your soul? What a disappointment. What's going on here? There's so many details and so many pieces of this picture that we don't grasp, understand, appreciate, and sometimes we just end up saying, what a disappointment. In, men, in some ways, Jesus' arrival is what you could call a disappointment. And I want to read a story that I came across many years ago. And there may be a detail or two in here that you know is dated. Try to overlook that and just receive the story. It's titled, The Day That Jesus Came to Washington, A Dream Sequence. It's written by Robert J. Hastings, whoever that was way back then. Plans called for Christ's plane to land at the National Airport in Washington, D.C. at noon. Government, business, and church officials were to meet him at the airport to form a parade down Pennsylvania Avenue to then to hold a public rally in front of the Washington Monument. 
All motels had been sold out well in advance of the arrival date. A tent city was set up in the mall and citizens opened their homes to thousands of visitors. Many people slept in their cars. Some spread sleeping bags on the sidewalks along the parade route. On the appointed day, hospitals and five stations operated with skeleton staffs and all businesses and schools closed. By daybreak, every road into Washington was hopelessly jammed. Souvenir stands and hot dog stands lined the streets. Best-selling items were Solomon's Head of Christ, you probably have one of those someplace, and medallions engraved with the Lord's Prayer. Many people brought picnic lunches. By 10 a.m., two hours before his plane was scheduled to land, authorities saw the situation was getting out of hand. The need for more sanitation facilities and food supplies grew critical. Downtown, spectators were jammed so tightly together that several plate glass windows were broken. Reports of widespread looting circulated. By 11 a.m., the president began calling for military units from Fort Myer in Virginia and Fort Meade in Maryland. Before noon, traffic had come to a complete standstill on nearby Interstates 95 and 495 that ringed the city. Cars and buses were backed up to Boston on the north and Fredericksburg on the south. Tension mounted as the minutes ticked away toward noon. His plane came into view and finally pulled up to the terminal. And the Marine band struck up, all hail the power of Jesus' name. As the last notes faded, a hush fell over the crowd. The door of the plane opened and every eye focused on one person. Even the delegation headed by the president, including his cabinet, members of the Supreme Court, and the congressional leaders were overshadowed by the presence. The silence was soon broken, however, by the sounds of argument among several of the welcoming officials. Pushing and shoving broke out near the limousine waiting to head the parade. A disagreement had arisen over who was supposed to ride with Christ in the lead car. By the time that controversy ended, Christ was nowhere to be found. Some said he had melted into thin air. Others reported he had slipped back through the cordon of police officers. Still others said he had gone back into the plane. Now, real pandemonium broke loose. Fraud, cried some of the bystanders. We knew Jesus would never come to Washington. It's all a promotional stunt. Slowly, the crowds drifted away. Reluctantly, the concessionaires took down their stands. Some sightseers actually tore up the pictures of Christ. It was past midnight before traffic again flowed smoothly on the interstates 95 and 495. Meanwhile, police continued their search for the missing Nazarene. At about 2 a.m., an unidentified plainclothes officer found him sitting on the curb of a deserted street in the inner city. With his arm around a runaway delinquent, he was retelling the story of the prodigal son. The irate official demanded, where in the name of common sense have you been? Jesus smiled. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. For I have come not to call the respectable people but the outcasts. What a disappointment. Not what we were expecting. This is a good time for a joke. <laughs> An administrative assistant runs into the Vatican City to the Pope's office and says, Holy Father, I have good news and bad news. And the Pope says to him, um, tell me the good news first. And he says, we just got a phone call from Jesus. He has returned. And the Pope said, that's wonderful news. What could be the bad news? And he reported, the phone call came from Salt Lake City.
Jesus was a disappointment in his time, too. Many of those Old Testament scholars that had studied the Bible all their lives, we called them the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and Jesus didn't speak highly of them, as you may remember, were expecting this grand Messiah, and in, the moment, in, in that moment in history, they were probably expecting that this Messiah would overthrow Rome that ruling government that was oppressing people in all kinds of ways and charging extra taxes and all those things you can imagine. And that's not at all what Jesus came to do. As the story just suggested, Jesus came for the outcasts. Those who are well, those who are fine, don't need that kind of help. Which we find in Mary's words of praise the day she received the visit from the Holy Spirit telling her she was going to bear this child. We used it a couple of weeks ago in this service. You remember the words. In the Magnificat, Mary is saying, the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has shown strength with his arm. The next sentence is, he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones. He sent the rich away empty. She also says, he lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. He has helped his servant in remembrance of his mercy and according to the promises. And Mary, even in that day, was saying, what will happen when Jesus comes? It may be a disappointment. It may be not exactly what we are expecting. I have another poem I want to read. We, we talked about uh, how life was at your house on Christmas. This is titled, The Day After Christmas. Tis the day after Christmas, and out in the den, Daddy is watching pro football again. The children are throwing and breaking their toys, and Mother is up to her ears in the noise. The melting snow drips through a hole in the roof. Boy, one of those reindeer sure had a sharp hoof. Ribbons and wrappings are spread all around. We hope when they're cleared, our lost child can be found. Santa long since disappeared in the fog. The turkey is tasteless and the eggnog won't nog. The holly and the ivy, the tinsel and the lights no longer bring warm glows on cold, darkened nights. Children who last week were helpful and sweet have mouths that are sassy and rooms that are less than neat. Those people with faces that smile forth, forth like elves are once again just their grouchy old selves. Then, carols of joy and hope filled the air, but now they are muffled by hard rocks' loud blare. The cold winds, which now make Aunt Josephine freeze, were not even noticed on Yule shopping sprees. Why should such a great event let us down hard? Is there something about Christmas that we disregard? The babe in the manger became a great man who died and then rose again. That was God's plan. His birth and his death, banners that God has unfurled to make us aware that he loves all the world. If we know that Christ loves us and always is near, then Christmas will come every day of the year. If we focus on the disappointment, we maybe need to refocus. We need to remember that God is with us in every day, that Christ comes to us every single day. It may be our expectations that bring the disappointments. There may be other ways to focus, to look at things, to, to understand how God is present, how God comes to us, what a difference God makes. In recent years, I have become a fan of the upper room. 
You're familiar with it. Some of you read it faithfully. Some of you walk by it when it's displayed out there in the hallway. All right, I'll share one of my disappointments. The little ones always run out so fast. And I always wonder, who's looking for an upper room when they're almost gone out here on the rack? And if I do anything in 2024, it's going to talk this church into buying a few more copies so more people can use the upper room. I'm going to share two from the current November-December issue. The first one is written by Jeannie Hughes of West Virginia. She says, Every spring I anticipated the white and lilac blossoms of my wisteria bursting from the branches. I was always surprised by their beauty. But for the last two years, my plants have had fewer blooms. Virginia creeper vines were slowly strangling my wisteria. Every time my husband and I removed a vine, another one would take its place. Similarly, I have allowed my own circumstances to stifle my relationship with God. And she lists losing my son in a car wreck, caring for my mother as she slowly slipped away due to Alzheimer's, and watching my husband struggle with cancer. I was trying to handle all of this alone and found it hard to give control over to God. Instead, I began questioning the challenges. Why was I experiencing so much heartache? As time passed, I realized I could never bloom alone. I needed to remember the promise of Jesus. He is the true vine. And when we remain connected to Christ, we can find new life springing from heartache or despair. It's that focus. It's that remembrance. I loved her phrase, and I underlined it in this copy, give control over to God. That's part of what we'll do in a few minutes when we pray together the prayer of the covenant prayer that John Wesley wrote and recommended to worshipers and disciples. One more, and I, I had four ready. I'm only going to use two from the upper room for this message today. This one's written by a guy from Idaho who writes, Every Christmas I get a little depressed. In this season, Christians do many things to make life brighter for others, but I can't do the majority of them since my age prevents me from driving or doing much physical activity. One Christmas, however, I kept hearing the song, The Little Drummer Boy. It changed my focus from what I can't do to what I can. The lyrics of the song explain that the little drummer boy couldn't buy a gift or do something brave for the Christ child, so he didn't think he had anything to offer. But then he realized one thing he could do was play a song for Jesus. So I quit thinking about what I can't do and started concentrating on what I can do. I can pray. I can be cheerful and friendly to those I meet at my church. I can celebrate Jesus' birth. Sometimes God helps us do things we don't realize we can. And God will honor even seemingly small actions if they are done to glorify God. So, like the little drummer boy who played his very best for Jesus, we can do our best and honor God with our service. Sometimes it's just how we focus. Sometimes it's just switching gears. Sometimes it's just turning aside from the disappointment to focus on other things to come. Sometimes it means remembering God is always with us and God is present and God is part of that. It's the last Sunday of the year. The calendars change over tonight. A new year lies before us. Sometimes we talk about resolutions. Well, what are you going to do different in the next year? What changes do we need to make? And John Wesley, starting in about 1738, no, 35, <clears throat> said Christians should use this watch night service, is what it was called then, to recommit ourselves to following God. And to do that, I invite you to take out the hymnal and turn in it to number 607, the prayer of John Wesley, the covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition.
And Wesley and his services said, keep a copy of this before you. Use it often. Remember it. Come back to it. Make a note of it. Every time you come to church, while you're waiting for the service to start, come back to number 607, if you will. But today, I invite you on this Covenant Sunday to pray aloud with me these words from number 607, a covenant prayer in the Wesleyan tradition. I am no longer my own, but thine. Put me to what thou wilt. Rank me with whom thou wilt. Put me to doing, put me to suffering. Let me be employed by thee or laid aside for thee, exalted for thee or brought low by thee. Let me be full, let me be empty. Let me have all things, let me have nothing. I freely and heartily yield all things to thy pleasure and disposal. And now, O glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Thou art mine, and I am thine, so be it. And the covenant which I have made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Our hymn teaches us another way to focus. It is titled, We Would See Jesus, His Star is Shining. We would see Jesus, Mary's most holy son. We would see Jesus on the mountain teaching. We would see Jesus in his work of healing. We would see Jesus in the early morning as he calls, follow me. We'll stand as we sing together.
Let us be seated. Will you pray with me? Holy God, on this most holy of Sundays, remembering your birth and your presence in the world, we invite you again into our hearts, into our lives, and into the world where we live. Use us and guide us to be your presence, your hands and your feet and your voice to others. Let us see Jesus in those around us, in the needy and the able, in the young and the old. Grant us, God, your vision that others might see in us your presence. We ask all this in the name of your Holy Son. Amen. We invite the ushers forward to pass the plates at this time. Uh, it's the last day of the year. If you wanted to make gifts during 2023 for tax purposes, get it in the plate now. <laughs>
God of hope and joy, the gifts we offer to you pale when our minds try to grasp all we have been given in this season, which include wholeness in our woundedness, hope in our despair, peace in our turmoil, forgiveness in our rebellion, and joy in our disappointments. Like Simeon, we have listened with our ears that we might not miss you, and our eyes have seen your salvation. You gave us light in our darkness and hope in our discouragement. Help us ex embrace your extravagant generosity as we give ourselves to others. In our Savior's holy name we pray. Amen. Let us be seated. From the bulletin. Friends, let us prepare to enter the new year with hearts that have been unburdened, and let us make our confession before God and one another, first in silent prayer. And now let us pray our confession in unison. God of stars and angels, God of sheep and lambs, God of abundance and grace, you know us well, better than we know ourselves. You hear us cry, Gloria, and praise, and you watch us tear things apart with our words and deeds. You hear us say, Thy will be done, and use me, O God, and you watch us do nothing in response to cries for help. You know us, and you love us, and you forgive. Hear us now say, help us to change, turn us around, make us more loving and courageous and hopeful. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. The service continues with the great thanksgiving over the elements. The singing responses are found on page 17 in your United Methodist hymnal. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you had formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, in whom you have revealed yourself, our light and our salvation. You sent a star to guide wise men to where the Christ was born, and in your signs and witnesses, in every age and through all the world, you have led your people from far places to his light. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, 
gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. And now with the confidence of children of God, let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for you. Those who are assisting in the serving, I invite forward at this time. I remind you all that this is not the table of Christ United Methodist Church. It is not a United Methodist sacrament. It is the sacrament of the Lord, and we believe it is the Lord who invites all to this sacrament. As they say, all means all. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. given for you. All is ready, will you come? Thank you. 
masculine faith. The blood of Christ given for you. 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 given for you. The blood of Christ 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 given for you. Turn with me in the bulletin to the prayer after communion. Let us pray together. Lord, we give thanks for the gift of this holy meal. We praise you that you have sent your son, that through him we might be reconciled completely to you. Christ sacrificed himself for us. Grant that all we are and all we do be a response to him, in whose strong name we pray, amen. Let this hymn send us out. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Let us stand.
not aware of any announcements, but I do have one question. Do we have Wednesday night bites this week? Not this week. We'll not, start not this week. Not this week. It starts on the 10th. And we're always looking for people to host. And we still need volunteers to host Wednesday night bites through the Wednesdays in January. Thank you. That's our only announcement. And now receive these words of benediction. Beloved of God, depart now in peace, knowing that you have encountered Christ our Savior. Go now to watch, to wait, and to spread the light of Christ to the ends of the world, for you have renewed your covenant with God. Let God guide you and use you as a disciple who will act inclusively, seek God, do justice, and serve others. Amen. Oh, really?